Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. Welcome, welcome. All right. Today, let's talk about boundaries versus rules. So I think boundaries can be one of the most confusing aspects of parenting. And I think I finally nailed down why. (laughs) So boundaries, I think, are very confusing to a lot of people, particularly if you grew up in a house without boundaries. And I know people who do their personal work. This is one of those areas where people get weirded out about not weirded out. I think they, they get confused or they misunderstand boundaries. And so there's boundaries with our friends and with other adults. And then there are boundaries with our kids. And this is where it gets really murky. And I kind of went down this rabbit hole because I was like, what is the difference between boundaries and rules? And a while back, I had heard this really succinct definition of boundaries. And it blew my mind. So I'm going to share it with you. Boundaries are about you and your personal limits. They are not an attempt to control the other person. And I was like, oh, that's the best definition ever. Because sometimes I think we think that we're putting a boundary in, but really what we're trying to do is control the other person. And this can be really clear cut in our social emotional lives with our friends. And I say social emotional because boundaries do tend to be social emotional as opposed to rules, which tend to be across society, right? Um, We don't uh, hit people is pretty good across society, right? And, or we don't run red lights or we don't, you know, we look both ways before we cross the street. Those are universal. Those aren't personal limits. Those aren't any social emotional. That's just how it is. Right. And so, um, it's clear with friends. I told this story a long time ago on the podcast. I had a friend, um, who was very, very, very smart. And I don't know if she just never had seen shows or anything, but she was constantly late and it was an issue with finding her keys. But the the original story was about how aggravated I got with her not being able to find her keys. I went to her house and put a nail in her wall and I was like, there, there's where your keys go. But this one night we had gotten tickets to the theater and she was a half hour late and didn't think anything of it. And I was like, you can't go to a show a half hour late. They close the doors. Like it's the theater. They literally close the doors. They're not opening the doors. It's not a concert. Like the doors are closed. I was so angry with her. And I did, in addition to helping her with her key management, (laughs) I set a boundary. And I said, if you're late, I will not be able to make concrete plans with you. I will never buy tickets with you again because you ruined this night for me. And so that's my personal limit, right? I set a limit for her because she I wasn't trying to make her on time. I was simply saying, this is your behavior and I will not tolerate it anymore. So that is a boundary. And I think, again, it's very easy to do with our friends, but with our kids, it gets murky, especially in these first like zero to six years, because the rules tend to be boundaries as well. So I went down this rabbit hole and I got very specific. What is the difference between rules and boundaries? And I do have notes because I don't want to miss anything. So rules are about actions. Boundaries are about limits, right? Rules are clear instructions on what to do, while boundaries define the space in which children can operate. I think that's so cool. And I'll give you some very concrete examples because I think this gets, again, like it feels like it's splitting hairs. But the reason I'm bringing this up is I keep hearing from parents, both in the parenting space and the potty training space. Well, I set the boundary and they cross the boundary. And I was like, well, no, you set a rule. They didn't really cross the boundary. You know, they set, you, you set a rule, like a child, you can't pee on the floor. Yeah, that's a great boundary. That's a great rule, right? Generally speaking, we don't pee on the floor, but that's not a boundary. Now, rules will have consequences. And I think, again, that's where it, that's, that's the, the, pinnacle of where it gets very confusing because rules have consequences, right? 
The boundary is you decide the consequences. Rules tend to be inflexible. They're set in stone and boundaries can be a little more flexible. Rules are non-negotiable and boundaries allow for some flexibility. Rules tell our kids what to do. Boundaries help kids understand why, okay? Rules give specific directives, while boundaries help children understand the reason behind the limit and the importance of respecting it. And both are going to have consequences, correct? So let's give an example. So let's say like mealtime. We sit at the table when we eat. If that's the rule, that is the specific instruction, right? The boundary is we have to keep food at the table or food doesn't leave the kitchen. This sets the limit on where eating can play, take place and it gives the child some freedom within that boundary. They can sit where they like at the table, for example, right? We're not necessarily controlling all the behavior, but we are saying the food stays here. Another example would be screen time. So you could have a rule of no screen time after dinner. And that is a clear, specific directive when screen time is allowed or not allowed. The boundary is we can watch one show after nap time and then it's time to play. So the boundary you've set, the limit you've set is one show. So that's a great one, right? Because how many kids try to negotiate a second show? So the rule is you may have kept the rule, right? We, we um, have dinner, you know, we have screen time after dinner. Yes. But the boundary is one show. And when you skew your own boundary, it can be more flexible, remember. But when you do that with a child under six, that's where you run into trouble, right? So the boundary with our little ones may have to be more stringent than when they get older. Does that make sense? Because that child, once you, once you say, yes, you can watch two shows, guess what's going to happen? tomorrow after dinner for screen time. They're going to want two shows, right? So that's where we have to be careful, right? So, you know, the I'm trying to think of like, even, you know, I see this happen a lot with parents who don't want to co-sleep. They work really hard on getting the kid in their bed, staying in their bed, sleeping all night. And then the rule when they're sick gets flexible, right? So the boundary gets crossed. The kid comes and sleeps with you because they need your attention. They need, you're afraid of their breathing. And that, when you cross that boundary, that blows up in your face. Now they want to sleep with you all the time. <laughs> so another example would be playtime with others. So clearly we don't hit and we don't bite. That's an awesome rule. And generally speaking, it's a very clear directive. The boundary might be we need to play gently with friends so everyone feels safe and happy. This teaches the child the expectation of gentle play with the focus on the impact of others, allowing them to make choices and try to play within that limit. And this is where we see limit testing come in, right? Is uh, You see this with siblings. So we use gentle hands, right? Yes, I didn't hit him, but we've all done the like, put your finger to your sibling's face, bugging the hell out of them. But technically I'm not hitting them, right? So what is that child doing? They're testing the limit. And that's when we hear that term limit testing. They're looking at your boundaries. They understand the rule, but their boundaries, they're like, let me see if I can push this a little bit, right? So another common example would be bedtime. Lights out by 8 p.m specific directive, right? The boundary might be, we have quiet time before bed to help us wind down, creating the expectation of calm before sleep, which can be met in all these different ways. Reading, cuddling, quiet play, giving the child some choice within the bedtime routine. So I hope you're starting to see where the flexibility lies in boundaries. And again, I think this is very different than our boundaries with our friends or extended family members. I think that's clearer, right? I think what mucks up with our kids is just how confusing the, the rule to boundary thing is. And again, the boundary is we're letting them have some choice. We're not overly controlling the behavior, but we do have set rules in the house. Uh, tidying up is a great example. Put your toys away after playing. That's a great rule, right? And we all wish our kids would honor that role. Um, 
the boundary is we keep our play area tidy so we can find our toys and have space. Again, this sets the standard for the environment so the children understand why tidiness is important, allowing them to learn the responsibility there within a set expectation. And so these are it, again, we go back to the social emotional, right? It's, it's the, the limits that people, not just us, but other people will expect how to interact with other people and respecting those boundaries. And some may be universal. Nobody likes to be bit, right? So that is a universal boundary probably, but we want to give the child a little freedom there. Like, don't, you know, you don't want to go to the playground, but don't hit, don't hit, don't hit. The rule is, remember, we don't hit. And then the boundary is we play gently with our hands. And what are you going to do? So that's the thing. That often is where boundaries and rules get confused too. So you set the boundary. So you say, if you hit or if you bite even one child, I know we've been having trouble with biting, but if you bite somebody even one time, we will have to leave the playground to make sure everybody's safe, okay? That is the boundary. That is also the consequence of the rule being broken, but your boundary is one time. Now, a lot of parents have the boundary of three chances, right? I'll give you three chances and then we'll leave the park. Three chances is a lot for biting, I would say, right? I think three chances is a lot, period. I think the one, two, three, if the child can do it on three, they can do it on one. And so I think you're just giving them opportunity to wiggle on one and two. So it is your clear expectation of now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when your limit that you've set is crossed? And that's the thing you have to stick with. The rules are always going to be broken with our little ones. Always. They're learning. They're, and they also can't keep the rules in their head, right? A three-year-old has only three years on the planet. This rule is pretty new to them. Even if they've had it since birth, which they haven't understood it till at least the last you know, year. And so, you know, we want to know that rules are going to be broken. There are consequences if they're broken, but the consequences lie in your boundaries. And that's what you have to be really steady about and really concrete, at least for periods of time. There's going to be flexibility as your child grows and there's more opportunity. They have more understanding. They have more impulse control. We can give them flexibility and it doesn't become law, right? You can let your child stay up late on holidays or on the weekends, and they understand that. A toddler's not going to understand that flexibility. So these limits have to be more like rules, a little more concrete. Yeah. All right. So in terms of control, so again, boundaries are about communicating what you will do about the limit being crossed. It is not in an effort to get control over your child because that will fail and then you won't have control. So again, the biting on the playground, the bound, the clear boundary is what you will do if they cross that boundary, even one child and we leave. Yes. And it, but you're not expecting them. You're, you're not expecting them to change their behavior. You have a biter. They bit once you had set the boundary. Now you leave. That's, that's very clear. It's an emotionally, emotionally clean transaction, right? But if you then say, okay, I'll give you one more chance, that is trying to control their behavior. You're like, okay, uh, okay, now you know the threat. You have just given a threat. You haven't set a boundary. You've given a threat. And you're trying to control them, and you want to stay at the playground. You want them to stay at the playground. So you're, you're skewing the boundary to control their behavior, and that usually backfires, especially with little guys. Um, Rules are about changing behavior, right? They're, they're guiding, controlling behavior. They set clear expectations that the child is expected to follow with consequences for not following. All right. And rules are immediate safety, structure, and order. That's what they're about, okay? Immediate safety, structure, and order. Boundaries empower the individual, you the parent, to manage their environment and responses. This, this is really key in helping kids foster a respectful environment. So this is the social emotional learning. And I hope I haven't confused you more. 
<laughs> but parents often ask me that. They're like, How, what is the difference between a rule and a boundary? And I think rules are set because we are controlling behavior. We have certain societal behavior and we have certain household behaviors that are non-negotiable. And there will be consequences for those. But the boundaries are just more social emotional. Now this comes into play too. Let's, let's take it out of parenting because I know so many of you struggle with family members who cross boundaries. Um, uh, and you know, and our friends or, you know, people that behave badly towards you. And so it goes for that too. You may have a rule that nobody gets to talk to me like that, but that's a hard rule to enforce, right? Because, people are going to be shitty all the time. And maybe it's a stranger. Maybe it's somebody who's grumpy. Maybe it's a friend who's grumpy. But boundaries, I think, tend to be an ongoing thing, right? So if you try to have a difficult conversation with a family member or a friend and they get very condescending, they don't let you speak, your boundary, you know, you may have a rule in your head like, all right, nobody's going to talk shitty to me ever or put me down. That's great. But your boundary is what are you going to do about it? So in that case, that family member or a friend, you might say, you know, whenever we try to have a difficult conversation, you really resort to being very condescending. If we continue to do this, I won't want to have difficult conversations with you, which means our relationship won't progress. So that is, that's that, you know, now we're not trying to control them. We cannot control other people. We're just saying, this is what I'm going to do. And then we have to be okay with that. So I see a lot of people when they're learning boundaries, they do think it's about, um, it's about, uh, controlling other people. So I'll tell you a quick story. When I lived in San Francisco, we had, um, you know, there was just always roommates coming through. I had rent control. I got in after the 89 quake. I had rent control in 1990 in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. I, you don't even want to know what I was paying for rent. It was so low. It was crazy. Nobody wanted to live in San Francisco after the 89 quake. And, um, so we had roommates coming through and because we had the most reasonable rent ever for, uh, you know, five people in a huge Victorian flat, uh, people would come and go. And so there were always roommate skirmishes, you know, and chores and who ate whose food in the fridge. And so we had a wastebasket in the bathroom and Florence, my best friend who died this year, Florence, um, was just starting therapy. She had really never done any personal work and she was like, just finding her way with boundaries. And, when you're finding your way with boundaries, especially if you come from a family without boundaries, you're going to overshoot. There is such a thing as too many boundaries. And I find that people who are just learning them, uh, overshoot. They get very too boundary. Everything's a boundary. And so that can be very, um, it can be very confusing. Um, so we had this roommate who, when she had her period, she would empty her feminine products directly into the trash can and the trash can didn't have a lid. She wouldn't like want, you know, how you, when you take pads and you roll them up in toilet paper or your tampon or whatever. So, you know, there was period products right there. And so Florence like lost it. She lost her shit about it. And she was like, you need to, I, I'm, I'm setting a boundary. And it was really cute because we watched enough roommates go through therapy. <laughs> There, well, I was in San Francisco in the nineties and everybody was doing therapy. We were all doing nine different kinds of therapy. And so therapeutic talk was very common. And she was like, my therapist said, I need to set boundaries. And my boundary is that you have to wrap your period products up in toilet paper. I don't want to see that. And I was like, Florence, that's not a boundary. Like we don't have that rule in the house and you can't make people do other things. And so that's a classic example of you not liking something. So you're going to try to set a boundary, quote unquote, but it's not really a boundary. You're trying to set a rule because of how you feel. Now that to me, that, that highlights to the difference between a rule and a boundary, because I didn't care. I think that wasn't important to me. It didn't bother me. Um, it didn't stress me out. So I didn't feel like we needed to set a limit. And Florence like was so adamant about like how disgusting it was and how gross. And, and so, you know, we ended up compromising. I was like, well, how about we get a, a, a waste basket with those, with a little cover, you know, like, like the domed cover and it flips and that way, you know, she can dispose of her period products without wrapping it up in toilet paper and you don't have to see it. And so we compromised on that. But again, I think it's just a great illustration of somebody overshooting, becoming too boundaried, and 
or thinking that the boundary is a rule for everybody and that everybody should feel the same way. Now, should everybody flush the toilet after they poop? I would say that's probably a good, a good rule for the house. Right. Um, but again, it's, it's like this murky area. And what I find is when you're new, you may overshoot boundaries with your spouse, with your kids. And so find out it's a lot like, I think what makes it so interesting if you're not accustomed to boundaries is it's, it's a lot like discovering your own self and your limits and your likes and your dislikes and what you are willing to put up with. Because I know I struggled for years. I let people just walk all over me. I just didn't realize I had a choice. I felt happy to have you as my friend. And I would put up with all kinds of nonsense, both from intimate partners and from friends. Um, and I was always like miserable. I was always a people pleaser and catering to people. And I remember it was like opening a box of presents when I realized boundaries, but then you start picking and choosing from this buffet of like, Oh, well, I like this and I like this and I like this and I don't like this and I don't like that. And I don't like that. And you can be off putting. So be aware of that. If somebody does tell you you're being too boundaried or too structured, um, take a minute and think about it. It, it could be the other person being reactive to not having you having had boundaries. Cause once you find them, you'll lose a lot of people. If you've been a pushover and you've been a people pleaser and you start setting limits, people are going to tell you you're being a bitch. And that, that does happen. Um, safe, emotional, emotionally safe people who have done their work, accept boundaries with no problem. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was, I was condescending to you when we got, I like, whenever I get into a difficult conversation, I channel my father and I do get condescending. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. Or, um, oh my God, I will never be late again. I pro you know, like we can hear the, the boundary, the person setting, and we can reflect and be like, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to be on both ends of it. But, uh, but if you're too boundary and somebody says something, just check in. Like, am I just saying no to everything? Am I starting to be picky uni and that's all I want? And, um, like you're picking just the same things from the buffet, right? And you're, you're trying to now control other people. Cause that's often what happens when we get too strict with the boundaries. You'll end up sitting home by yourself doing nothing. Cause if none of us like everything, right? So I, you guys are in the age of like play dates. You're going to run into parents you don't like. You're going to run into kids you don't like, but you have to take some of the good with the bad. You can't just say, I only want the things that I like. I only want the things that make me feel emotionally safe. And having been, in San Francisco for so long and dealing, being in a, a city that thrived on therapy and therapeutic talk. Like that's literally every day. It was like, Hey, how was your therapy? Which therapy did you go to? Like, I'm not getting, we were like saturated in therapies is you would see this as people beginning, beginning to think that they should have everything the way they want it. And you can't, you're not going to have that. So recognize that yes, you can have boundaries, but you're also going to have to put up with some things you don't like, some shitty behaviors in other people. So I hope that clears up boundaries for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, I think this, I think this conversation is fascinating. And again, I thought that nugget of like, Oh, it's really about me and what I'm going to do. And so now I, I literally, I can flip a boundary, you know, like, Generally speaking, I don't want to hang out with people who are just sitting around drinking and doing nothing but getting drunk. But then sometimes I'm like, well, I haven't gone out with anybody in a while. Maybe I'll hang out with these people just because I, I want to be social for a little while. But my boundary is I leave when people start repeating themselves or I leave when, you know, at nine o'clock because I just don't want to be on the road too late. And I like my bedtime. So that's my boundary, right? I don't generally like to be there, but sometimes I put up with some behaviors that I don't love because it's fun. Then when it stops being fun, I leave. <laughs> All right, you guys, as always, I appreciate you listening. If you like this podcast, please share it. Please subscribe, please review. And as always, rock on and have an awesome day. Okay, bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, 
I have oh crap potty training. I have oh crap, I have a toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. <laughs> you can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.